Hi everyone, my name is Natasha from Love's Cure Ministries. Thank you for joining me today for another podcast for my Did You Know series. Today I'll be discussing the real life pit that Jesus was in, according to Psalm 88. I also have a few other scriptures to reference, as well as a few photos to share. So let's get started. So the first few photos that we're looking at are maps of Jerusalem. It also shows the location of the palace of Caiaphas, the high priest. Here in this next photo, you'll see a picture of 2000 year old steps dated back to the time of Jesus. These steps are noted that it is possible that Jesus walked up these steps to get to the garden of Gethsemane or Gethsemane. Depends, I guess, where you're from and how you pronounce it. But these steps go past the house of Caiaphas. And so I could just imagine that there were many nights where Jesus went up and down these steps with his disciples after prayer and fellowship and had to probably be really discreet and quiet in passing the house of the high priest. Here in this next photo, you'll see that there are ruins which are thought to be the house of Caiaphas. I actually have a description that I would like to read to you in just a moment, but from these photos, you can start to get a clear idea of just how close the quarters it was for Jesus and his disciples as they went to and from just to fellowship, just to gather and, you know, have time alone with Jesus. And you could just imagine how many times they went up and down those steps. And like I said before, they had to be pretty much, you know, really discreet because this was the high priest. I'm sure there were many times the Sanhedrin met at his house uh, to congregate and to talk about the politics of their religion. And so you want to talk about close quarters. That must have been something that, you know, they were on guard all the time, I'm sure. Obviously, Jesus, being who he is, was at peace. But For the disciples, I'm sure they must have felt very on edge a lot of the times. As you can see here from the next few photos, just some pictures of the location to give you a better idea of what the area looks like. There's a great uh, aerial view from the top of the steps. It's basically at the landing um, where the St. Peter's Church now stands. It was erected in the Byzantine time period, which began around 330 AD, 300 years after the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus. As we move on, you'll see some photos of inside the church, along with uh, some photos of just the area. There's a few plaques uh, that reference Psalm 88, and it also shows a picture of one of the pits that was found under this massive mansion which was clearly owned by a wealthy family a priestly family and as a matter of fact this would be a good time for me to read the description that i found in regards to this location and the remains found that are thought to be the house of caiaphas this excerpt is from jesusjourneybook.com and it reads Excavations at this site, now known as the Church of St. Peter in Galicantu, have unearthed the remains of a large mansion apparently connected to the Jerusalem priesthood. There are servants' quarters, indicating the house was owned by a wealthy family, and a complete set of weights and measures used by the priests in the temple, along with a door lintel inscribed with the word Korban or sacrificial offering, showing this was a priest's residence. And it goes on to read, there's a guard room, one floor above us, with wall fixtures to which prisoners were chained. In the middle of the room are pillars with holes to fasten prisoners' hands and feet for flogging. On one side of the guard room, there's a pit in which captives were lowered with rope. Originally, this vertical shaft was the only way in or out of the dungeon. Today, 
we walk down narrow steps to get to the place Christ may have been held for questioning. It is important to note also, in addition to this excerpt, as you'll see in some of the videos, if you have a chance to watch them, that locals believe that this is in fact uh, the area that Jesus was taken to and that this is in fact the palace of Caiaphas, the high priest. As we go on, you'll start to see in these next several photos that here are some of the pictures as referenced in that uh, excerpt that I just read to you, where you can start to see that there are, um, obviously the levels are a little different today. Things have to be excavated and then the church was built over this location. But you can see from some of these markings, the red arrows and the red lines, where you can see the cutouts of windows. You can see there are certain cutouts with pillars that were put in um, around the first century when monks occupied this area. You can also see where there are armholes uh, embedded into what is now the ceiling where this flogging would have taken place. And there's also a section where you can see a window cutout where it's possible it could have been the guard's room or an area where the guards would have taken their post. And so now we arrive to one of the most, um, to me, the most impactful pictures. And you can really get a sense of all of this if you watch the video and you're literally, you know, you literally feel like you're walking through this dungeon as these people are exploring this area. And so this particular picture is showing the view of the hole, the original hole in which prisoners and Jesus would have gone down, would have been lowered in with a rope. There were no cutouts at the time. It was pitch black. It was literally a pit. It was also referenced as the heart of the earth because it was dark and it was desolate. And so just looking at this picture, you can get a real sense of if you were in this dungeon, if you were in this pit looking up, imagine Psalm 88 going through your mind or vocalizing that as you're in this dark, desolate place and watching these guards close up that hole and the sound you would have heard and the light whatever little light they had, slowly but surely fading away. And so as you're looking at this picture, I want to read Psalm 88 to give you a sense of what Jesus went through in the midst of all of this at that time, waiting to go to the house of Pilate where he knew he would be sentenced to death and crucified. And this is Psalm 88, the New King James Version, and it's called A Prayer for Help in Despondency. O oh Lord, God of my salvation, I have cried out day and night before you. Let my prayer come before you. Incline your ear to my cry, for my soul is full of troubles, and my life draws near to the grave. I am counted with those who go down to the pit. I am like a man who has no strength, adrift among the dead, like the slain who lie in the grave, whom you remember no more and who are cut off from your hand. You have laid me in the lowest pit, in darkness, in the depths. Your wrath lies heavy upon me, and you have afflicted me with all your waves, Salah. You have put away my acquaintances far from me. You have made me an abomination to them, I am shut up and I cannot get out. My eye wastes away because of affliction. Lord, 
I have called daily upon you. I have stretched out my hands to you. Will you work your wonders for the dead? Shall the dead arise and praise you? Salah. Shall your loving kindness be declared in the grave? Or your faithfulness in the place of destruction? Shall your wonders be known in the dark? And your righteousness in the land of forgetfulness? But to you I have cried out, O Lord, and in the morning my prayer comes before you. Lord, why do you cast off my soul? Why do you hide your face from me? I have been afflicted and ready to die from my youth. I suffer your terrors. I am distraught. Your fierce wrath has gone over me. Your terrors have cut me off. They came around me all day long like water. They engulfed me all together. Loved one and friend you have put far from me and my acquaintances into darkness. And now I would like to read Matthew chapter 26 verses 46 through 74. After envisioning what it must have been like for Jesus to be surrounded by those who are against God, those who are blind to the things of God, those who are so caught up in politics, in tradition, in their culture, so self-absorbed into their own mindset and way of thinking, their own idea of how God was going to lay out prophecy. They put themselves above God. And for that, they were blinded. When you deny the Son, you obviously deny the Father. But when you take into your own hands the Word of God, and you form it in your own mind that that which was spoken of should happen in not how God wills it to be, but in how you think it should be, will you not be cut off from the things of God? We are called to have the mind of Christ, which is then the mind of and will of God. And when we go against that, because of our own humanism, because we are so deadlocked into religion, that we forget about relationship with the Father, you don't know him then by spirit. And is not God spirit? Jesus is the manifestation of the image and spirit of God. He is the word made flesh. He is the example. And it just goes to show the mindset and the hearts of those that surrounded him at that time. The religious persecution that took place by those who were put in place and set to stand on the foundation of God's word. They became so engulfed in who they were. They became gods to themselves and didn't even realize it and masked it with God's word, which is right and true. But they started to form God 
and the things of God and his will into their own image. And what did God say when he hand wrote his commandments and gave them to Moses? He said that we should not make idols unto ourselves. And that includes dictating and forming and molding what you think God should be and what he should do and how he should do it. And because they were lovers of themselves in thinking that they knew better than God, they were blinded. They were blinded to God's only begotten son. And so I want us to just take a moment to, after reading Psalm 88 and being in that that dark, desolate pit, let's go back for just a moment to Matthew chapter 26, verses 46 through 74, when Jesus was betrayed, when he was arrested, all of the build up, he was completely left out there all on his own and he knew it would happen. And so I just wanna go back to that moment after seeing that dungeon, after seeing where people are taken and flogged and beaten and just left with no food, no water, no comfortable bed, no TV, like prisons have today. Well, it's not so comfortable, you know, where you're sleeping, but at least they have somewhere to sleep. But no modern day prison. This is hardcore first century dungeon with nothing but rock and darkness and dust and desolation. And now we see here in Matthew, the betrayal and the arrest and all of the blindness, all of the fear that left Jesus out exactly where he knew he would be because he knew the things to come. And how great is our savior, how great is our God that he stood firm and strong and at peace because he knew, he knew after all of this, we, not him, but we would have the greatest gift we had never known. And it reads, verse 47, excuse me, Matthew chapter 26, verses 47 through 74, and I'm beginning at verse 47 for the betrayal and arrest in Gethsemane. And while he was still speaking, behold, Judas, one of the twelve, with a great multitude with swords and clubs, came from the chief priests and elders of the people. Now his betrayer had given them a sign, saying, Whomever I kiss, he is the one. Seize him. Immediately he went up to Jesus and said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. But Jesus said to him, Friend, why have you come? Then they came and laid hands on Jesus and took him. And suddenly one of those who were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword, struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. But Jesus said to him, put your sword in its place for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Or do you think that I cannot now pray to my father and he will provide me with more than 12 legions of angels? How then could the scriptures be fulfilled that it must happen thus? Before I go on, I just want to put in a little side note. Jesus referenced 12 legions of angels. And we know that a legion just one legion of angels is 1,000. So we know how great Jesus is, but here he's saying, listen, I can take care of this if I wanted to, and I have authority to do it, but my Father's word must come to pass. According to his will, it must be fulfilled. In verse 55, it says, in that hour Jesus said to the multitudes, have you come out? As against a robber with swords and clubs to take me, I sat daily with you, teaching in the temple, and you did not seize me. 
but all this was done that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples forsook him and fled. Could you imagine 12 of your closest friends or family being around you through all the ups and downs? And then one turns to you and betrays you, throws you to the wolves without a thought because of greed. And the other 11 who should have your back just gone. They just run away. No one there to stand for you. No one there to have your back. And Jesus knew all of this before it would happen. And yet still, he proclaimed the word of God. And even then, to all of them who were blind to him, he still professed the things of God, that the scriptures of the prophets would be fulfilled. And even then in that moment, they were walking in scripture being fulfilled and that prophecy coming to life. Further down it reads in verse 57 through 67, where it talks about Jesus facing the Sanhedrin, it says, And those who had laid hold of Jesus led him away to Caiaphas the high priest, where the scribes and the elders were assembled. But Peter followed him at a distance to the high priest's courtyard, and he went in and sat with the servants to see the end. Now the chief priests, the elders, and all the council sought false testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but found none. Even though many false witnesses came forward, they found none. But at last two false witnesses came forward and said, This fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. And the high priest arose and said to him, Do you answer nothing? What is it these men testify against you? But Jesus kept silent. And the high priest answered and said to him, I put you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said to him, It is as you said. Nevertheless, I say to you, hereafter, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes, saying, He has spoken blasphemy. What further need do we have of witnesses? Look, now you have heard his blasphemy. What do you think? They answered and said, He is deserving of death. Then they spat in his face and beat him, and others struck him with the palms of their hands, saying, Prophesy to us, Christ, who is the one who struck you? In this last section here, verses 69 through 74, it talks about Peter denying Jesus and how he wept bitterly. Initially, this podcast was just to discuss the pit and for it to just be kind of like, um, you know, a sightseeing tour, if you will, a virtual tour and some history behind it, some biblical knowledge behind it and scripture. And as I was reading through, I felt that through the spirit, it was important to include Peter's denial of Jesus because after seeing this location in real life, that it still exists today, you can go there today and see this pit and see this location. You can see the 2000 year old steps. These locations are real. What happened to our Christ, our, our precious Messiah is real. And to see that through all of that, Peter, the rock, the foundation, that Jesus would build his church, his body of himself would be built up on this man. And to see that he denied Jesus, and through all of that persecution and that beating that he took, how they defamed him, how they embarrassed him, he still was so wonderful and so good that after he resurrected, after three days from this horrible persecution, execution, and, and this crucifixion, when he rose from the dead, fulfilling the scriptures of the prophets, 
He restored Peter out of love. And so we should know, even in this moment, that a man that walked with our Messiah, a man that was chosen as a disciple to bear witness and testimony to the things of our Christ and our God, the first of those who have the privilege and honor to proclaim the good news of the gospel, which is that Jesus was crucified for our sins, he was buried and rose from the dead on that third day, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4, that even Peter could be restored. The Bible says that each and every sin will be forgiven with the exception of blaspheming the Holy Spirit. And we can see here that Peter was no different. He was included in that that within his sin he was still forgiven and in fact he was restored by our messiah himself verse 69 reads now peter sat outside in the courtyard and a servant girl came to him saying you also were with jesus of galilee but he denied it before them all saying i do not know what you are saying and when he had gone out to the gateway, another girl saw him and said to those who were there, This fellow also was with Jesus of Nazareth. But again he denied with an oath, I do not know the man. And a little later, those who stood by came up and said to Peter, Surely you also are one of them, for your speech betrays you. Then he began to curse and swear, saying, I do not know the man. Immediately, a rooster crowed. And we know that shortly before this entire situation, Jesus said to Peter that he would deny him three times before a rooster crowed. And I'm sure Peter was extremely fearful. Obviously he was fearful because he denied Jesus, but imagine the fear of realizing right in that moment that the Messiah prophesied to you and it was fulfilled right before your eyes in that time, in that moment. That was a greater fear of what his outcome would be, both in this life and the next. Praise God, glory to our King, our Savior, and our Father in Heaven that we see here in uh, the book of John, chapter 21, verses 1 through 17, where that after Jesus resurrected, he was seen by hundreds of people that had bear witness to his resurrection. He had been seen by many, including the disciples, including the women at the tomb, and uh, here, well, actually Mary at the tomb, and so we see here, um, entitled Breakfast by the Sea, we see another encounter with Jesus and the disciples, and we will then read in verses 15 through 17, where the love of God, the mercy and grace of our God was upon Peter, and Jesus restored him. And so I'll read this final excerpt of scripture in the book of John, chapter 21, again that's verses 1 through 17, New King James Version. After these things Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, and in this way he showed himself. Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, We are going with you also. They went out and immediately got into the boat. And that night they caught nothing, but when the morning had now come, Jesus stood on the shore. Yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Then Jesus said to them, Children, have you any food? They answered him, No. 
And he said to them, Cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast, and now they were not able to draw it in because of the multitude of fish. Therefore that disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he had removed it, and plunged into the sea. But the other disciples came in the little boat, for they were not far from land, but about two hundred cubits, dragging the net with fish. Then as soon as they had come to land, they saw a fire of coals there, and fish laid on it, and bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish which you have just caught. Simon Peter went up and dragged the net to land full of large fish, 153. And although there were so many, the net was not broken. Jesus said to them, Come and eat breakfast. Yet none of the disciples dared ask him, Who are you? Knowing that it was the Lord, Jesus then came and took the bread and gave it to them and likewise the fish. This is now the third time Jesus showed himself to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. Before I go on, I just want to note something really important. Here, Jesus appears before the disciples as they were out to sea. And as they come into shore and they see the coal burning fire and they see that there are already fish cooking along with bread. Now here come the disciples and they have a net full of fish and yet that net is not broken. How wonderful our God is that here is a portrait of not only the Sabbath, but it is also a portrait of what is to come and what has already taken place. Jesus told his disciples in the beginning of his ministry that he would make them fishers of men. And so now we see the, these disciples so worried about not wanting to ask Jesus who he was or if that was really him or just validating that it was the Christ. They didn't even realize that he was showing them through that net bountiful of fish that after his ascending to heaven to sit at his rightful place at the right hand of the Father on the throne, they would now go out into the world and spread the good news of him, which is God's word, which was with God in the beginning. And so now here they are dragging in that large net of fish, which is surely to come. And they didn't even realize it. And here Jesus has fish already laid on the fire. Glory to God. We too go through that burning of fire. And that fish was symbolic of those disciples that he laid on the fire. Like that miry clay that would be formed. They would also go through that fire and be burned and they would be molded into great men of God and our Lord Jesus Christ. And he had bread on that fire so that we could remember our Christ. And those disciples would always partake in that holy convocation, that holy day, according to God's word and according to Christ's word as well. He reiterated what was already said, what was already established. And he reinforced that word of his father. And he said, do this in remembrance of me. Keep this Sabbath day holy. And so now as I read the final part of this scripture where Jesus restores Peter, it says in verse 15. So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord. You know that I love you. He said to him, Feed my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, Do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord. You know that I love you. 
he said to him, Tend to my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. And I think that after the words of Jesus, there is nothing left that I could say that would be greater than the words of our precious Jesus. Thank you for joining me for this podcast. And until next time, bye friends.